the hardest man alive, the only member of the U.S. Armed Forces to complete SEAL training, the U.S. Army Ranger School, and the Air Force Tactical Air Controller training. I think it is abundantly clear that this man is a self-made beast. Well, it was pretty crazy for me. It, um, it, it took a while to get to that point where enough was enough. Um, what happened, I, I came home one night from work spraying for cockroaches. And um, long story short, I turned on the, the um, Discovery Channel. I saw some guys going through Navy SEAL training and they were going through Hell Week and they were getting their ass just beat. You know, in and out of the water, guys ringing the bell. Um, they were just suffering. And I was weighing like 297 pounds. And I had to make a change in my life. You know, I was at an all time low and I wasn't going anywhere. And I was exactly what everybody said I was gonna be, which was nothing. So I had to make a change. I came from a horrible background. I got called nigger every day of my life growing up, um, lived in a small town. The Klan headquarters at that time was about um, 20 minutes from where I lived. The, uh, one of the high ups in the KKK son sat behind me in two classes. So he called me nigger all the time. I got my first car. They spray painted nigger, we're gonna kill you on it. So I was just an insecure, scared kid. And the only way I could find myself was to put myself through the worst thing possible. I had to build calluses in my brain the same way I built calluses on my hands. So I broke the Ginsburg Royals record for pull-ups a long time ago but I failed at it twice. And I did 67,000 pull-ups in trying to break this record. So to do 4,030 pull-ups, I had to do 67,000 for training for that. Wow. And so what I realized is for me to become the man I wanted to become, I saw myself as the weakest person God ever created. But I never blamed God for anything he did to me. So I wanted to change that to be the hardest man ever created. Am I that? I don't know, but you had to have a goal. And my goal when I was sitting there, not going to school, being bullied, being having no self-esteem, my goal was the only person that's gonna turn this person around is me. The only way I can turn around is put myself through the worst things possible a human being can ever endure. And that'd be the only way that I can build this brain to handle anything that comes in front of it callousing my mind through pain and suffering. You have to look inside of yourself to see what you really want. What, what are you passionate about? We use these words and these little phrases of only the strong survive and all this other crap. They're all just fucking words. I get so tired of hearing people just talking. Like right now, someone may think Goggins is just talking. <laughs> you don't know me. So when I speak, I speak from passion. I speak from experience. I, I, I speak from suffering. Okay, I, I'm afraid of my shadow. How can I overcome that? Go in the military, get your ass kicked, do things you hate to do, be uncomfortable every fucking day of your life. Roger that. I'm not the smartest kid in the world. Okay. Instead of somebody saying, oh no, you're smart. No, no, don't say that to yourself. I said to myself, no, I'm a dumb motherfucker. Okay, Roger that. How you get smarter? Educate yourself. So the things that we run from, we run from the truth. We're running from the truth, man. So the only way I became successful was going towards the truth. As painful and as brutal as it is, it changed me. It, it allowed me to become, in my own right, who I am today. So I said, you know what? I have to Google something that's, that's evil, something very hard. I knew nothing about ultra marathons. I hadn't even run a marathon. I knew nothing about this world. So I Googled the, you know, the top 10 hardest races in the world. And what comes up is a bad water 135. So 135 mile race through Death Valley in the summertime. So I called the race director up at the race and said, hey, Chris, his name is Chris Costin. I want to do your race. So we had a long conversation. You know, I was, I was much heavier then. And I hadn't put running shoes on over a year. How heavy are you at this point? I'm around between 240 to 270. I was a heavy guy. But the long and short of it all was I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. I was a big time power lifter. I lifted weights heavy, that's what I did. Right. I just got back home from Iraq, went straight to free fall school, and then this happened. So I called Chris Costman up on a Wednesday. He says, look man, the only way you can qualify for my race is to run 100 miles at one time in 24 hours or less. 
There happened to be a race that Saturday, so four days later. And he said, if you qualify by running 100 miles or less in 24 hours, I will consider you my race. I'm gonna cut to the chase. I signed up for this race, it was called the San Diego One Day, where you run around a one mile track for 24 hours to see how many miles you can get. Mm. My goal was 100 miles. So um, I got to mile 70 and I cleared 70 miles in like 12, 13 hours pretty quickly. But I was done. My feet were broken. I was stretch fractures, shin splints, muscles were tearing. I was in bad shape. I was eating Ritz crackers and drinking <laughs> mile plates. That's all I had. So I sat down at mile 70 and at this time I was married. And I, I look at my wife and I was like, um, I'm, I'm messed up bad. So I literally start to turn white. And when a black guy turns white, you're pretty fucked up. <laughs> so here I am, I'm all fucked up in this chair. I'm at mile 70, I got 30 fucking miles to go. I'm jacked up. I gotta go to the bathroom and the, and the bathroom's like 20 feet from me, it's a porta potty. I can't get out of the fucking chair. So I'm peeing blood down my leg. Whoa. Pooping up my fucking pack. And I got 30 miles to go. And I'm, I can't stand up because my, my blood pressure's all messed up. I've been in three hell weeks, ranger school, overcome so many obstacles in my life. This last 30 miles of this race is when I realized a human being is not so human anymore. We have the ability to go in such a space. If you're willing to suffer, and I mean suffer, your brain and your body, once connected together, can do anything. And this 30 miles was the life-changing moment. I was out of it. I was in the worst pain in my entire life. I was, to me, on the brink of death. And I was able to chunk this 30 damn miles into small pieces. I was so driven. And I'm not, not going to say motivated because motivation is crap. Motivation comes and goes. When you're driven, whatever's in front of you will get destroyed. So I sat in this chair and I was so driven to succeed in this race. And, it, and at this time, everybody goes, were you thinking about the guys that died? And I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't. This became a personal thing. This became me against this race, me against the kids that called me nigger, me against me. It, it, it just became something that I took so, so violently personal. And I broke this thing down into small pieces. I said, okay, I gotta get nutrition. I gotta be able to stand up before I can get off this curb and get off this chair and be able to go 30 miles. So I went through all these small steps and I, I was able to stand up. And then from standing up, I was literally walking around with my wife at the time and she goes, you're not gonna make the time. She goes, you're, running, I mean, you're, you're walking like 30 some minute miles. I got to mile 81. And the second she said that I'm not gonna make the time, I ran the last 19 miles nonstop. I had to get compression tape and I taped up my ankles and I taped up my feet. And that's how I got through that race. Was it like a hematoma? I mean, what are we, what no, was No, so happening? what happened was I, like my shins hurt so bad mm. from having stretch fractures that the only way I could continue on oh. was I taped it so I wasn't doing the flexor motion mm -hmm. that, that activates your, your shins. So I taped my ankles and my shins up and I got that from, because in my third hell week, they weren't gonna let me go back through, you know, train anymore. Right. So I literally went through all of Bud's, my last SEAL training with stretch fractures and shin splints. And how I did it was I would tape my ankles all the way up to my calf every morning. So for the first hour, the pain was excruciating. Mm. But what happened is my feet would go numb. And I did that every single day for six months. The I mean, cookie jar is something that I've made up of all the failures of my life. All the things that I was, I failed and I went back. I failed and I went back and I finally succeeded. All the things that kicked my ass. I put them all in the cookie jar because at times of hell, even the hardest men, in times of suffering, what we do is we forget how hard we really are. Because that's what suffering is. Suffering is a test, that's all it is. Suffering is the true test of life. And so that cookie jar travels in my brain. So whenever I get put in a situation where I have poopy pants, the woe is me mentality of, oh my God, life sucks. I take a second, I take the one second decision. 
I step out of my life for one second, go in the cookie jar, pull up, oh, motherfucker, you went, you were in three hell weeks and finished two. One of those hell weeks, a guy died and killed it was so bad. Oh, you are a motherfucking badass. You are. I put it back in the cookie jar and I remember who the fuck I really am. I'm not the kid that, got, that was called nigga. I'm not the scared kid. This is who I am. It's a reminder of who you truly are at the core of yourself. But what I was saying to myself the whole time on that track, and, it, and this is what I say to myself, self-talk and visualization are the two keys to my success. I believed for that last time, 19 miles, I was indestructible. Because I took myself in that chair, crapping up my back, peeing blood down my leg, shin splint stress fractures, I use all that for motivation versus negativity. I use it for motivation. I, I, I said to myself, who on this fucking earth would still be going right now? You are. You are. You got to be the hardest motherfucker on the planet. Is it true? I don't give a fuck. At that time, right. it got me to the finish line of that fucking race. I believed it. I believe it today. I believed it enough to where my body said, he's not gonna stop. And that's, I took all the negative things, I need to go to the hospital, this and that, and I used it all. Who the hell could even get out of that chair? You did. Who the hell would even think about taping stress fractures up? You did. All those things I used for motivation. We all have a cookie jar, and we all have a jar of fuck and where shit just, it just ain't going right. And in Hell Week, what they do in Hell Week, because this is where I really went to the dark side. What they do in Hell Week is they design Hell Week to find your flaws. And they do a really good job of that. It's 130 hours of continuous training. You may get two hours of sleep and they beat the shit out of you and find everything wrong with your mentality. And then they start Hell Week. And that's the beauty of it. And for me, I'm not some you know, nasty guy giving guy. You know, I don't have a great bit of talent in anything. So what got me through horrible times was the dark side. People have a, a hard thing to understand. I hate to run. And, and, and what makes me so crazy, it doesn't need more, is people go, well, well, why do you run if you hate it? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to take showers and eat either. I hate that too. The, the whole, the, that's life, man. That, and and, and, and it, it wasn't until I changed that mentality that I became somebody. I hated going to school, so guess what? I was dumb as shit. That's what, it, one plus one is two. But if you can get through to doing things that you hate to do, on the other side is greatness. That's what people understand. By me running, I am callous in my mind. I'm not training for a race. I'm training for life. I'm training for the time when I get that two o'clock in the morning call that my mom is dead or something happens tragic in life. I don't fall apart. I'm training my mind and my body and my spirit so it's all one so I can handle what life is gonna throw at me because the life I've lived, it throws a whole bunch at you. And if you're not physically and mentally prepared for that, you're just gonna crumble and you're good for nobody. No matter if if you think you're dumb, no matter if you think you're fat, no matter if you are fat, no matter if you've been bullied, or no matter if you just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan and you have no legs or your arms or whatever, man, we all have greatness. It just, you gotta find the courage that's out there, but it's gonna take hard work, courage, self-discipline. It's gonna take all the non-cognitive skills, all the non-cognitive skills to be great. You know, smart is good, all this stuff is good. That's all cognitive. It's the non-cognitive skills that sets you apart from everybody else. And, and that's what it's all about.